Care, a series of talks sponsored by the UCSF Memory and Aging Center and the San Francisco Institute on Aging. The conference is in its ninth year and is held annually around Valentine's Day, hence the title of the conference and the specific talks. I'd like to review a few housekeeping details before introducing our speakers for today. I'm Jennifer Merrilies, and I'm a nurse at the Memory and Aging Center, and I'll be moderating today's talk. If you have a question for the speaker, please write it in the Q&A section, which you can find by hovering your mouse at the bottom of the screen and then clicking on the Q&A button. We'll have time at the end of today's talk to answer some of the questions. We are providing American Sign Language interpretation today. This talk is being recorded and will be available on the Memory and Aging and the Institute on Aging websites, which I will put into the chat. At the end of today's talk, we will put a link to a course evaluation in the chat and welcome your constructive feedback. In order to receive CE credits, participants must complete the evaluation. It takes about 10 working days to get the CEs. If anyone has questions about this, feel free to contact Catlin Morgan, Education Manager at the IOA. And again, I'll put her email in the chat. Now, if you do not look at the chat today, do not worry. Everyone will get a follow-up email with all the links that I've just mentioned. So I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Alejandra Sanchez is a geriatrician and behavioral neurology fellow. She'll speak first. She'll be followed by Carly Miller, a speech language pathologist. Both are with the Memory and Aging Center. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. I am. Uh, Delighted to be here and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will be presenting the topic of embracing cognitive evaluation. Uh, I am going to share my screen now. One second. And I think we are able to see it. Great. Well, um, I think to embrace cognitive evaluation, uh, it's um, first we need to know its benefits uh, and uh, to demy demystify it, which is what I will try to do today. Uh, for the learning objectives, object for today, we have um, one to describe the cognitive domains and how they affect function and behavior and also uh, to learn about three common instruments for cognitive evaluation. So first, what is uh, a cognitive evaluation? It's really um, an assessment of a person's uh, thinking abilities or cognitive functions that we also call, call cognitive domains. Uh, for example, uh, one cognitive domain is memory but there are others that we will uh, review in the next few slides. And the way that we do this is by talking to the patient and their loved ones uh, about what kind of symptoms they've been experiencing. And then we do um, a set of uh, evaluations via uh, an instrument or a tool that help us uh, identify the exact deficit in a more objective way. And why should we do one? Uh, I think, first of all, it's helpful to detect what is normal from what is abnormal. And then if there's something abnormal, which domains uh, are affected? And this way we can know uh, more about what about uh, the, the strengths and the weaknesses of the patient. And, and that will also help us determine uh, a diagnosis. And we know that uh, uh, dementia and cognitive impairment in general is under-recognized. And once we have a diagnosis, we're able to provide uh, management of, of the problem and uh, care better for the patient and, and think about uh, how we can help this patient and plan for the future. So this is you know, a very simple um, 
picture of the brain. Uh, it is uh, an oversimplification, but in general, we, we think that the cognitive domains are uh, in different parts of the brain. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, ability to, uh, for judgment, uh, planning, or personality, we think it's like a frontal part of the brain, the frontal lobe. Um, then uh, the domain of uh, visuospatial uh, abilities is really in the back part of the brain involving the occipital and the parietal uh, lobe. And then uh, the verbal and visual memory is in the temporal lobe, uh, as well as, uh, as the main aspect of, of language and speech, uh, and typically more on the left side of the brain. So these are the cognitive domains. Um, the first one, learning and memory, is what we are more uh, or most familiar with. Uh, and there are different types of memory. There could be a verbal memory or a visual memory, and there could be a uh, short-term memory, something that you remember from a few minutes ago, a few hours ago, or even days, or uh, a remote memory, th things that maybe happen in your childhood. So there, there are different types of memories. Um, some examples of uh, some deficits in this area is forgetting uh, details of recent uh, conversations uh, or events, and this can affect people by uh, having trouble with uh, remembering to take their medications or showing up on time to their appointments or showing up to their appointments because they may forget the uh, that they have an appointment or maybe they forget the day uh, that they are today and they cannot keep track of that. Um, and that can also uh, cause some repetitiveness. Like maybe they're asking many times, oh, when is the appointment uh, or at what time are we going to the restaurant? Maybe you just told them uh, five minutes ago, but they keep asking because they don't remember that they just asked you. Um, and other things that can happen, more like visual memory, is that um, they might have difficulty remembering the route to a place that, that, that they've uh, driven many times. Um, now, that can be uh, somewhat uh, helped by sometimes using Google Maps, and then you cannot detect that. Um, but that's an example. And the way that we, we test for this, uh, typical way is to uh, provide a, a list of words to the patients. And then a few minutes later, uh, we ask them the words. And then we see how, how uh, many of them remember. And then you know uh, uh, the other cognitive domain is executive function. And um, this uh, domain is uh, provide the ability for us to initiate and, and plan goal-directed activities. Uh, typically, activities are require multiple steps. Um, for example, uh, we see this in, let's say, cooking or preparing a meal. This require, requires multiple steps uh, that, you know, getting the ingredients and cutting and then putting in the same certain order. And sometimes we see that people get a little bit confused because they're not organizing themselves and planning what they have to do. Or, or finances, dealing with uh, paperwork and sending something and keeping track of, uh, you know, how they will do certain uh, certain activity, and and we see that people can get disorganized um, if they have problems with executive function. It can also affect problem solving uh, and judgment. Uh, for example, uh, some people can become very gullible and then they are the victims of scam, right? Because they cannot discern if this is a person who's trying to help them or somebody who's, you know, trying to uh, take their money, right? Um, and then, you know, all of these activities require some volition or they require for us to initiate and that's also part of the cognitive domain. Uh, another cognitive domain is attention and, and uh, it can be simple or more, a little bit more complex, and it's really just the ability to focus on in a particular um, task or, you know, people with this problem can uh, get this distracted or they can have fluctuations attention. Sometimes they seem fine and other times they, they are not able to, to focus. Um, and some way that we test for this is to, we ask them to repeat uh, a number or a sequence of number and then you know, in that way, we see if they're able to to tell us that sequence of numbers or to actually say it backwards. And then that's a more of a complex attention. Um, 
Another uh, domain is language. Uh, and that's also uh, something that we're uh, very familiar with. Uh, and we often see problems like word finding difficulties. It can really happen to all of us, but when it happens uh, more frequent, uh, it can be you know, a symptom of, of a cognitive impairment. Uh, other problems that can occur is like the ability to name something or to say the right word uh, when you're, you're trying to talk. For example, people can mix up words or just pronounce it differently uh, when they didn't do that before. And they can also have difficulty with comprehension. Um, and their speech output can increase or decrease. So we often hear, I often hear that people stop uh, talking as they used to in, you know, when they're meeting, you know, their friends or at work and they just become quiet. So that can be also a sign that, you know, there's something that could be wrong. And lastly, we have the uh, difficulties with a uh, visual spatial uh, cognitive domain. And this is really a, a, a problem with uh, visual discrimination or depth uh, perception, uh, or it could be with recognition. For example, I had a patient that she couldn't really tell apart her house from other uh, houses. And there's a problem with, you know, with discrimination there. Um, and then an example of how we test uh, executive function, uh, it's uh, the trail. So here we have, uh, you know, a set of letters and numbers, and we ask the patient to start uh, at one and then go between letters and numbers in ascending order. And, and for these, they have to actually plan and think how are they going to reach to, to the end, which is the E. And this is like asking for them to yeah, to, to uh, organize themselves and, and this is an example of how we could, we could test it. And then we have some examples here for language. Um, this is uh, uh, word finding difficulties. Okay, what's this? Camel. And that is a, uh, I call it a It starts with C. Oh, C anemone. Close. Is it a seed pod? Oh. A sea horse? Sea horse. Or great. Sorry, so here we saw that the patient couldn't name what he was seeing, but he actually had an idea of what it was. And at the end, with providing options, he was able to, to tell what it was. It's so another example of difficulty with uh, naming, but this is different because it's a problem with uh, meaning. Um, it's some kind of a bed. What do you do with it? Well, I'm sorry, what What's that? I don't know. Do you know what you do with this? So here, oh, sorry, here we have uh, somebody who couldn't name it, but it's because they really didn't know what they were looking at, right? They lost the meaning of that object and it can also happen with words. They can lo lose the meaning of words. Um, we also have patients that have difficulty, they are able to listen, but then they have difficulty repeating uh, a long sentence. And here's an example of what I mean. Today was a warm and sunny day. Sunday, right. Can you repeat that again? Yes, it was. It said that today was a sun. Was oh God. Summer and. Huh. Man, you know, trying to look too fast. It's tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Let's start with something easier. How about today is Monday? Monday. Today is Monday. So, the, yeah. So the in this case. Uh, this patient couldn't do the, the long sentence or couldn't repeat it, but a shorter sentence, he was able uh, 
to you know, hear it and then repeat it back. So this could be an example of how we can change our behavior with the sentences for them to understand what we're saying. Um, and then for, for this part, um, this is an example of something that we asked the patient to, to do. And let's see. Now pretend in your left hand that you have a toothbrush and you're brushing your teeth. Take the brush brush and put it in my head? Oh, sorry. Pretend that you have a toothbrush in your left hand oh. and you're brushing your teeth. Okay. Here's a uh, brush and... Pretend you have a toothbrush okay. in your hand. Okay, and okay good. I might have been, I don't know. We can still hear you, Alejandra. Oh, wait, you can, oh, my, my now computer pretend just broke. Oh, can you see me? No, we can't see you, Dr. Sanchez Lopez, but we can hear you and we can see your slides. Okay. Um, oh, you can see my slides. Okay, perfect. Well, you know, in the previous uh, example, uh, this patient, uh, the same patient actually uh, that had difficulty with repetition couldn't uh, comprehend what was being asked of them, although they were able to do it. So just with repeating the information, they were able to do it. Now, for, for the examination, we have um, screening tools uh, in that they use some of the things that I just showed. And we have a diagnostic uh, also uh, evaluation, which the screening tools, I want to make uh, sure that I say that these are uh, basically, a tool that tells us what is normal from abnormal. Um, and it will be just, you know, not, not providing a diagnosis, but uh, a screening uh, instrument. And the diagnostic neuropsychological evaluation can give us more detailed information. So one um, example of this type of test is like a mini cock. And this is a very simple uh, test where you ask the patient to say three words and ask them to repeat them back to you in a few minutes later and to draw a clock. Um, and it has a score from zero to five and two or less is probably impaired. That's what I mean, like this is just a screening. And here we have a normal clock, you know, 10 past 11. Uh, and then this is an abnormal clock because it is not 10 past 11. So they couldn't do that, um, you know, that aspect, but they were able to put the numbers there. And then we have a very abnormal uh, clock here. And, you know, he wouldn't get the points for this. Now we have uh, the next three tests. They're a little bit more complex where they have different aspects and, and this is the mini mental uh, exam. And uh, it, or also called Polstein. And with these, uh, this has a total score of 30 but a cutoff of 24. And it has uh, aspects of orientation or end memory, language aspect, and visual spatial. For example, here we have uh, you know, uh, two overlapping pentagons, and we ask people to draw it again. Uh, and some aspects of attention, uh, for example, asking somebody to spell the world backwards and uh, provide some, some uh, example of divided attention or more complex attention. And then you, you sum all of these, and um, like I said, less than 24 would be abnormal. And then we have the MOCA. So the MOCA test. We apologize. It looks like uh, Alejandra got dropped. We're going to wait a minute and hope that she can join us.
Carly, should we have you go to your talk now? I can, sure. Okay, why don't we do that and then we'll let Alejandra finish up when she's able to rejoin. Okay, it looks like um, I'm not able to turn on my camera. So it looks like the host needs to give me permission. Okay. Hi everyone. Let me share my slides real quick. Okay. All right, hi everyone. My name is Carly Miller. I'm a research speech language pathologist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. I'm in the, I'm a part of the ALBA Language and Neurobiology Lab. I'm also affiliated with the Aphasia Research and Treatment Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. First, I wanna talk about what language changes are typical as we age. Healthy older adults have difficulty with accessing words, especially proper nouns, but it's not because their knowledge of the words has deteriorated. Many of you maybe have noticed that tip of the tongue feeling where you just can't remember the name of something, but it's not because you don't know what that thing is. In fact, older adults perform better on vocabulary tests than younger adults. And they have the knowledge of the words, but accessing them in a conversation might be difficult. On the other hand, language decline is not normal if it's getting worse more quickly than other adults in that per person's age range, or if these significant changes in language take place before the age of 60. I'm going to list changes in language that are not normal in healthy aging, but not all people with language decline will experience all of these symptoms. And somebody does not need to have all of these symptoms to have an atypical decline in language. So changes in communication that are not typical in healthy aging include difficulty naming common objects or familiar people that they interact with often difficulty articulating words, speaking in complete sentences, understanding the meaning of words when you hear one, and holding on to information that you've heard. For example, um, it's, it wouldn't be a typical change in language if you go to a hospital and somebody tells you the room number that you need to go to, and by the time you get to that floor, you've gotten off the elevator, and you don't remember that three-digit room number, that wouldn't be a typical decline in language with age. This term for atypical de decline in language is aphasia. Aphasia causes difficulty with spoken language, and by that I mean naming, talking in sentences, and articulating sounds and words. It means a difficulty with comprehension or understanding what other people are saying, reading and writing. And aphasia is commonly associated with stroke. So if you're familiar with the term aphasia, you may be thinking of aphasia from a stroke. Um, when aphasia is from stroke, the onset is sudden and it doesn't get worse over time. In fact, aphasia from stroke may improve over time or remain stable. Much of what we know about aphasia and communicating with a person with aphasia is from a long standing history of stroke induced aphasia. But over the past several decades, we've learned more about communication disorders from progressive neurological diseases such as dementia. In contrast to aphasia from a stroke, um, individuals who have dementia um, do have decline in their language over time. And I'll talk a bit about the specifics in a minute. So for individuals who have dementia, they may have, they may likely have difficulty communicating as well. So for example, early on, people with dementia may complain of not being able to find the words they want to say. They may say, I know what it is, but I can't say it, which was an example um, that Alejandra was showing in the video right before her, her computer cut out. Um, many will have difficulty with conceptual knowledge or understanding the meaning of words. 
They may have difficulty perceiving the sounds and words as well as producing the sounds and words or saying the correct word. So for example, um, somebody may say dog instead of cat or another, another related word, or they might say bog instead of dog, not getting all of the exact sounds correct. and they may have difficulty with reading and writing. Um, as well as sentence processing, so understanding a sentence, especially when it has more complex grammar. As I'm sure many people have seen, um, individuals with dementia may repeat the stories that they've told, lose their train of thought, or have disorganized conversations. So we typically think about memory getting more impaired as dementia progresses and communication may become increasingly difficult as well. So in terms of speaking and expressive language, but also understanding will become more difficult as dementia progresses. In addition, we would expect to see changes in other areas of cognition, um, not only language or memory, but also math or doing calculations, solving problems, and abnormal behaviors may increase. We also see, as Alejandra mentioned, um, a loss in the desire to initiate communication with other people or to interact with others. So I'd like to talk to you all about strategies that you can use when communicating with somebody who has dementia, as it's likely that they have had changes in their language and communication as well. So I always recommend to people who are interacting with my patients to eliminate all distractions. As I mentioned, someone who has dementia is going to have a harder time comprehending what's being said to them. And if there are visual or auditory distractions like a TV, people having a conversation nearby, going to be even more difficult to understand what's being said to them. So it's important to turn off that TV, go to a quiet place before having a conversation, especially if you want them to be able to, to follow what you're saying. It's important to keep com communication simple, but not, in a, not talking down to the person. So there are different ways that you can do this. You can use higher frequency words. So words that we use more often. Um, rather than words that we use less often. So for example, the word trash receptacle might be harder to understand for somebody with dementia compared to just the word trash. Put it in the trash, put it in the trash receptacle. One of them's a lot easier to understand. Another example of high versus low frequency words would be utensils, the low frequency word compared to fork and knife. Fork and knife is a word that we hear all the time, but utensils is, is less commonly used. And so that might be a harder word to recognize for somebody with dementia. I recommend using short and simple sentences. It can be hard to remember a longer sentence, to remember all of the words that were said. So for example, if one example of a longer sentence might be, um, Hey, come on in, why don't you come on over and have a seat? Um, I'll be right there in a second. Instead, you could say, hi, sit down. I'll be there soon. Keeping it short and simple, but not condescending. Um, on that note, concrete language is um, easier to understand than abstract. The phrase take a seat is actually a more abstract way to say, sit down, it can be harder to understand. Um, another example of a more abstract sentence might be, um, you know, idioms that we know of, like it's raining cats and dogs, things like that. Those are harder to understand for somebody with dementia. I want to emphasize that if somebody doesn't understand what you're saying, it doesn't mean that you need to speak more loudly. Um, oftentimes, revising and keeping in mind these tips might be a good way to get your message across. 
That being said, if you know that the patient has a hearing loss, that talking louder might help. Um, but it's important to know uh, what their hearing status is before interacting with them, whether you need to talk louder or just revise what you're saying and making it more simple. You know, I wanna also point out that I know that a lot of these strategies I'm mentioning might seem like common sense, um, but it takes a lot of practice to start using these consistently in your communication. Um, I'm mentioning these strategies now so that you can start implementing them um, in your communication in day-to-day -day life. Um, so like I said before, if there's a misunderstanding and a patient doesn't know what you're saying, um, rather than saying more, say less. So substitute, use higher frequency vocabulary, you know, more common words, or say shorter sentences. Um, there can be ways to emphasize key words that you wanna make sure get across. Um, so, for, so for example, um, if you have a word you really wanna highlight, you can say that word a bit slower, pause after you say it to emphasize that key word. To emphasize that you're asking a question, you could change the pitch of your voice. When we raise our pitch at the end of a question, it's clear that we're asking a question and expect a response. So for example, do you need to go to the bathroom? Versus, do you need to go to the bathroom? The first one is a bit more obvious that I want a response back. So some other tips would be checking for comprehension. Um, this goes for both you and for the, oops, I'll go back a little bit. <laughs> so checking for comprehension goes for both you and for the patient. Um, somebody with dementia or anybody really um, isn't going to be quick to make it known that they're not understanding what you say. Um, people often might smile and nod along, even if they're not following what you've said. Um, and, so it's important to check to make sure that they understood you. People are better at masking communication difficulties than we think. Um, a way that you can see, oops, okay. A way that you can, uh, to sh okay. So if a patient says something to you and you don't understand what they've said, um, you know, checking in your own comprehension. So what you can do is repeat back what they've said to you that what you do understand. So for example, um, if a patient said something to you and it didn't really make much sense, but you knew that they're talking about a food or something like that, you could say, okay, I know you're talking about a food. Can you help me a bit? Don't pretend to understand when you don't. Also give the person plenty of time to talk and to respond, especially if someone has difficulty with word finding they might need extra time to get their message across. They might have a long pause in the middle of their sentence. It doesn't mean that they want you to jump in necessarily and finish it for them. Unless they seem frustrated, then trying to jump in. But if they're still you know, calmly in the middle of their sentence, give about um, you know, maybe 10 seconds, give them some time to try to come up with that word. And that silence might be uncomfortable, but um, remaining calm might help them feel calm in that moment of being stuck. Same goes for um, giving them plenty of time to respond. So like I mentioned before, it can be difficult to comprehend what others are saying, and it might take a good 10 seconds to comprehend what you've said. So after you say that short sentence, pause, give them time to comprehend and show that they do understand before maybe saying that question again or before moving on to something new. Pause after you've said it so they have time to process it. I want to emphasize to avoid talking about a patient in front of them or speaking on their behalf unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, people can tell when you're talking about them in front of them. Um, involve them in the conversation if you can or at least ask them for their permission to, to talk on their behalf um, to do so. So I highly recommend being positive about attempts to communicate. So don't focus on errors or feel the need to correct them. It can feel, um, 
it might feel like you need to, to let somebody know when they've said a wrong word, um, but that's not necessarily what I recommend at all. Um, so for example, if a patient is pointing to their cup of water and says, I want more coffee, um, I wouldn't recommend you know, laughing at them or saying, did you just say coffee? You meant to say water, say water, um, which is something that I see a lot. Um, instead, I would recommend saying, oh, you want more water? Sure, let me get that for you. So I wanna talk a bit about a concept that we call multimodal communication. Um, so using all available communication modalities. Um, so we have our spoken communication, our verbal, um, but you can also supplement it with other ways to communicate. Um, so this goes for you as the person talking to somebody with dementia. Um, this is also something that we do in speech therapy with our patients, but right now I'm mostly focused on things that you can do when communicating with a patient. Use your hands to communicate. Do gestures um, to reinforce what you're saying. Um, you can point to something while you're talking about it. You know, like, do you need the hairbrush? And point to the hairbrush so they know what exactly you're talking about. You can write down words or key words that are helpful in your message. So if there's one word maybe that they're not understanding or maybe um, it's a really important part of your message, write down that word. Sorry, my dog is having like a little, <laughs> he's going crazy next to me, <laughs> but he's okay. Hey buddy. <laughs> I think he was acting out his dream. <laughs> anyway, other ways that you can supplement your spoken communication are by drawing a picture, showing what you mean. And that might help them understand what you're saying. Take advantage of facial expressions and eye contact. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be facing a person when you're talking to them. Conversations are so much more difficult around a corner from each other or if you're facing another direction. Um, that being said, check for eye contact to make sure that a patient is listening to you when you're talking to them. If they're in the middle of doing something else, if they're looking at the TV, if they're looking somewhere else, they're probably likely not understanding what you're saying or even paying attention. Make sure you have their eye contact before talking. Along the lines of facial expressions, um, you know, as dementia progresses, it's, it's important to emphasize the emotional component of communication, um, emphasizing you're not alone. There's somebody here talking to you more so than trying to um, exchange facts or knowledge. Um, as it's harder for them to understand or to speak, um, just having somebody there communicating with eye contact is, is communication too. So as I kind of said before, um, using these other modes of communication in, addi in addition to talking um, gives redundancy of your message. So make sure that it, your message comes across. They're not understanding the words that you're saying. Or you could keep your it so that patient's not understanding. You can whip it out and draw a picture. So if a patient is stuck, um, you may want to ask the patient questions in a yes or no format or multiple choice, especially if they're having a hard time under, or sorry, they're having a hard time coming up with the words that they want to say. Um, if you ask it in a yes or no way, they don't have to come up with the words. Um, or if you say, you know, do you want to go to the lunchroom or do you want to go to bingo? They don't have to come up with those words on their own. If a patient is talking to you and you're not really sure what they're getting at, offer a guess. 
um, or maybe say, are you talking about something in this room to help guide you toward what message they're trying to convey? Encourage the person to talk around a word if they can't come up with it. If you notice that they're stuck on a word, um, maybe say to them, if you can't think of the word, could you describe it? So if a patient says something like, oh, you know, the thing you write with, they might not be saying the exact word, but they're still getting their message across. So even an incomplete description is still likely to be helpful. If they said that, you know, I would still know they're talking about a pen or a pencil and that's, that's close enough. Um, so this, you know, provides valuable information to you as the listener, if you ask them to, to describe what they're trying to say, but it might help the person with dementia cue themselves to think of the word. And we see that a lot with our patients. If they describe something or use gestures to help communicate it, it might help them cue themselves to say the word. So I'll talk a bit about as dementia progresses, um, the burden of communication is going to shift from solely verbal communication that we're used to, to other modes of communicating, like the ones that I mentioned earlier, you know, using gestures or drawing or writing. The burden of communication is also going to shift away from the person with dementia and more toward you, the communication partner, um, to, help, to help get you the message across and to help uh, with communication um, using the strategies that I'm talking about today. And as I mentioned earlier, um, as, as dementia progresses, the emphasis is going to be more on the fact that you're interacting with them and more than, or more so than making sure they understand these specific things that you're saying. So I want to talk with you all a bit about uh, memory and communication books. This is something that I recommend um, to, to any patient who has dementia who may benefit from this. So this would be a small or portable book with personal information like their name, their address, like this one down here. Especially for patients who have trouble remembering these words or remembering this, these concepts. Um, you can have pictures in a book and information about their family, their friends and activities. I made this fake page here um, with me and my sister. Um, you may also have a page that has different family members on a page and their name or in their relation to them. And this could be if they're having a hard time with thinking of the names of family members or recognizing family members. You can also have pictures or pages with pictures of important vocabulary to them that maybe they might have a hard time coming up with or if you want to show them different options of things available to them. I'll show an example in a bit. Um, with these pages, I would recommend grouping them by category. So things that are related to each other being on the same page. You can include reference pages like a calendar or a map like this one here, um, or maybe even a log of who that person has talked to that day. Um, so for example, if a patient is always saying, you know, I never talk to my daughter, but they talk to them every day, you could have a page with you know, who did I talk to that day? What time did we talk? What did we talk about? So that you can show them, oh, look, you talked this morning and you talked about this. Um, these communication or memory books could help elicit information to help them come up with more words. If, if word finding is hard, they can help improve conversation. Um, you as the communication partner should be using these books too when you communicate, pointing to the pictures on the pages as you talk can help make their understanding better. Can also help with curbing behavior problems. So um, an example of that is if a patient repeatedly asks about a family member who's moved away, um, you could have that on a page in the memory book too. Um, you know, if they always say, oh, I wanna see my brother, um, that could be a, book, a page in the book um, with information about how they moved away. And these books could be, you know, everybody's communication or memory book will look different. Um, it can be tailored to specific needs. So if somebody has maybe a hard time with their vision, you could have a really big print in that person's book. Um, there are other ways that they can be adapted. So if it's, somebody, if it's a patient who isn't going to remember to carry around their book, it could be a book that's small enough to be in their wallet or in their pocket, or maybe worn in some other way to get creative. So 
I just wanted to show some other examples of communication book pages. Um, this one here could be used if you wanna ask them, what would you like for breakfast? Would you like any of these? And that way they can point if they don't have a, a, mem a menu with pictures. This page has example of things that are used to get ready for the day. So you can point to these when talking about them. Um, you'll notice that these are real pictures rather than icons. Um, as somebody's conceptual knowledge um, pro pro progressively gets worse, it's going to be more difficult to understand um, a picture drawing compared to a picture of an item that they actually use every day. And notice how the words on these pages um, aren't long sentences, it's just short words or simple sentences. Other examples here are, um, this is a page that you could have if they're having pain, to ask them how bad is the pain? Where is the pain? If for some reason that's easier than pointing on their own body. And this page has examples of types of pain they may be feeling. Um, you know, they can point to it on the book or you can point, you know, do you have pins and needles? Do you, are you feeling numb? So I'm just going to list some of this is repeating what I said on the previous slide, but just for, uh, for emphasis, uh, these books could have personal information, pictures of family and friends, maybe information about their, their education, where they went to school or their career. Could have maps, maybe food and restaurants. If this is somebody who's still going out and going to restaurants, um, you could have different options of where they'd like to go. Um, daily activities. So, you know, pictures of uh, different place, different things that they do day to day. So they have that option to point or to see what the options are. If they don't understand what you're saying in terms of the options. Pictures of places someone might want to go, hobbies, past and future travel. Those are just some examples. I'll leave it back up for a second. Um, I wanted to um, highlight this website that I was informed of called In the Moment. Um, this is a, a great website that offers training videos and workshops um, for people who are interacting with somebody who has dementia. One area of focus on their website, which I think is really interesting, is using aspects of improv in response to situations that arise with someone who has dementia. It has uh, different workshops or TED Talks, um, a lot of different resources here. The first website is more of the, the in the moment groups general website. So this is where they list their talks and their um, and different workshops that they provide. The second link I have here, um, the beinginthemoment.org has the actual videos that I mentioned. So um, here are some screenshots of those videos basically uh, showing if a, something goes wrong, what could I have done differently? And showing all of the different ways something could have gone differently. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up here. Um, always remember that fatigue affects communication. So somebody who's tired is going to have a harder time finding words or understanding. So save important conversations for the morning or when they're feeling well rested and communication abilities might be inconsistent. So just because somebody could remember something or could say something yesterday, doesn't mean that they can today. So I know that I'm out of time, so I think I'll skip ahead a bit. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank my mentors, Dr. Maya Henry at UT Austin and Dr. Maria Luisa Gorno tempini here at UCSF. Um, and a special thank you to Dr. Henry for contributing um, the content and the materials I shared today. Thank you. Oh, there we are. Hi again, I'm sorry about the Wi-Fi problems, um, but this is a world, world now, right? Uh, well, thank you for your patience. So I am gonna continue just uh, to talk about the, um, the cognitive assessment uh, or evaluation. And here we have uh, the mini mental state examination. 
And uh, this is one of the first tests that was developed. And it has different aspects of cognitive domain as we see here. Um, the only thing that this test uh, lacks is the really executive function, um, which some of the tests that we'll show next uh, will, it does have some tests uh, of executive function. And um, this is a 30 point test and it can have a, a score, a cutoff of a 24 or less. And next slide, please. Here we have the, the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, and this is a, a newer test has been here for a few years. Uh, it does require a certification, but people can do it and it just you can just log in and, and certify yourself um, as of actually a few days ago that is needed. And uh, it's also a 30 point uh, scale or uh, test where the cutoff here is different, it's 26. Um, and here you have on the right that there is uh, different types of cognitive domain uh, being assessed. So we do have the memory and orientation. Uh, we have a special spatial uh, test, which is copying a cube and uh, doing the clock that has like a mix of visual spatial and executive function. Uh, and we have the trails uh, for executive function and also the ability to generate. Remember like this initiation that I talk about executive function, there is uh, a test of asking someone to say as many words as they can think of that start with a certain letter. And that is really um, a lesson I think about the, the next uh, number of uh, words that somebody can think that is more frontal. Uh, and then we also have naming and other language aspects uh, and attention, like the, the number sequences that I was talking about before. Um, I like MOCA because it's available in different languages. Uh, it is available for uh, people that have vision impairment. There's a different uh, type of MOCA and people that have, uh, there are illiterate, there's another um, option uh, for MOCA, which have different cutoffs. And, um, you know, I think this is a, a, a comprehensive uh, tool, a screening uh, assessment. Now, next slide, please. This is another test uh, that is uh, used primarily in the VA because it was developed uh, in patients or uh, the VA patient population. Uh, it is also a score of 30, has a, a different cutoff. That's why you don't have to keep track of where the cutoff is. Um, it is usually in the instrument and it has aspects of uh, memory, orientation. Uh, there is some uh, executive function because there's a clock drawing there. Uh, there's uh, generativity asking in this case uh, to name as many animals as somebody can think of. Um, and then also um, it, it has a, a question of uh, thinking of calculating what's uh, the, um, the time needed to pay something and then what, how much you have left. And, and I think, you know, this is also a good test and, and I think it's good for, uh, for the VA population because it was validated there. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have different uh, strategies to assess cognition that is not necessarily uh, an instrument, a tool, and things that you can do in your day-to-day. -day. Uh, for example, uh, uh, orient orientation questions, which is just um, asking, you know, what's the day, uh, where somebody is, and also asking about current events, like recent news or what somebody had for for dinner or for lunch. I tend to avoid breakfast because typically it's like more general. We usually eat the same thing. Uh, and, and But details of lunch and, and dinner tend to be different. So that's a good, something to, uh, good to ask. Um, or you can ask somebody to do a task that has more than one step, like, you know, take a piece of paper, put it, you know, in, on the countertop uh, or, and then come back to me. Some, you know, like you can just make up something that requires multiple steps. Uh, and you can ask somebody to point to something, either if they don't do it, either it's because of a visual spatial problem or maybe they don't know what, you, what you're talking about. Uh, and 
above all, you can observe a behavior. And many of you are in like the natural environment of the patient and you can see so many things. Uh, and just if something doesn't make sense to you and seems like a little bit odd, you know, you can just pay attention and you, know, you can try to think what, what's happening there. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so some of the um, take home points for this, uh, this lecture, I think that uh, one is that uh, one com uh, more than one cognitive domain can be affected uh, and can impact the, the patient function in, in different ways. And uh, an evaluation of the cognitive domains can help us identify what are the specific deficits uh, which are so important for us to know and plan and coordinate the patient's care. Uh, and lastly, uh, knowing uh, the cognitive strengths and weaknesses can help us uh, communicate, as you saw uh, with Carly's uh, presentation, and best care for our patients. Thank you. I think next slide, and I think that's my last one. Thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot to, to both of you um, for this interesting information. Um, we've got a couple, we've got a little bit, a few minutes for some questions and answers. One question, um, this might be more for Carly, um, wondering about the difficulty that some people have with photographic representations and are black and white icons better for signage? Um, versus photographs. Wondered what your thoughts were. Sure, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you're right. Most most signs that we see or warning signs are are these black and white icons that can be harder for somebody with dementia to recognize, especially if their their conceptual knowledge has gotten worse. Um, if you have any control over this, I would recommend um, having actual pictures. So um, for a wet floor sign, you know, having a picture of water um, so that it's very clear um, what, what is the warning. Great. And um, maybe one for you, um, Alejandra, um, what, what, what should we do if a person doesn't do well on, on those cognitive tests? What would be sort of the next step? That's a great question. And I think, you know, once we identify that, you know, they, they didn't do well there, I think they need to have a little bit more of a, a further evaluation with, you know, either, you know, a neurologist or geriatrician uh, and try to identify exactly what's the cause of this cognitive impairment, uh, right? Is it a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's or something else? So I think, um, following up on that abnormal test uh, with uh, a comprehensive evaluation. And it's oftentimes, but it's not as clear, it requires what I said uh, about the neuropsychological evaluation. Great, something more in depth, you think? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, great. Um, this is a question that we probably all can relate to, um, but the person's pointing out that it's harder for, for their patients to understand when we're all wearing masks. And um, I guess this is a question for both of you. Um, do you have some strategies um, for how to help with that? Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think so many of us are, are struggling to understand what people are saying out in the world right now when people are wearing masks. Um, this is especially true for people who have communication difficulties. Um, so I would recommend keeping in mind the strategies that I, that I talked about to help with comprehension. So in addition to, um, so first of all, talking really clearly and over articulating the sounds that you're saying might help get your point across using gestures or writing what you need to say, if it, that's not enough. Um, and, you know, pointing, using pictures, all of the things that I mentioned before, um, I also wanted to mention that there is um, there are masks out there that have a clear window so that people can see your mouth. Um, there are, are there are several um, disposable masks on the market that are FDA approved. Um, one that I know of and have used is called the Clear Mask. Um, there's another one called Safe and Clear. Safe and Clear it looks just like a surgical mask and it has a clear window. Um, I also recently saw um, 
I think an FDA approved mask with a HEPA filter that's reusable called LEAF. Um, it's, it's about $50 and you can reuse it if you have the resources to get it. it it's something that I'm looking into getting. Terrific. I, I, I think that, you know, I, those are like great strategies. And, and the only thing that I would add, add is, is something that you will probably do is just like, don't get discouraged and, you know, be patient. And, you know, you can, if they forgot or they didn't understand, you can kindly let them know again, right? Great. Okay. Um, so we're at time. I want to thank you both for talking today. Um, it's been really interesting. Um, I hope our attendees all enjoy the talk. Um, next week, join us for another talk in this series. We're going to be focusing on behavioral symptoms and ways to manage and support our patients and our caregivers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.